Good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about oceanographic models, so how we actually simulate the ocean using a computer and why and different applications of how those models can be used for everyday life. We're going to look at how we use the policy centre and the computers which are available there that we can get much faster computations at a higher resolution and over longer periods of time. One of the day-to-day -day things that we do uh, in a way is that we predict currents along our coast. Um, if anyone's swimming to Rottnest, uh, we actually do a prediction of the currents through the swim. So people know what, at, when they're swimming, how to swim. The currents are much stronger when you towards get to the island and that's when you're tired. So if the currents are going north and south, you need to actually adjust how you're swimming and where you're swimming. People can take that information to beat somebody else. This is a plot that basically shows someone who was swimming last year from the port to pub and that someone actually happened to be me. When we use oceanographic models, what we're basically doing is tracking parcels of water. So let's say we put an orange in the ocean, we're basically tracking where that orange goes, but we don't actually put an orange in the water, we actually said that orange is actually consists of a parcel of water, and we basically follow that piece of water around the world. So that is, and that we use by computers. And sometimes if you put some dye, that dye patch also would not only move, but it also will spread. So we're actually uh, taking both of those uh, into, into account. Ocean models. So in here, as I said at the beginning, we're trying to simulate the nature inside a computer. And the nature includes the atmosphere, it includes the earth, it includes the the sun, where we get the heating from, and we have the moon, where we get the tides from. So we need to take all of those into account and simulate those forces from the sun, the moon, the atmosphere, the wind, uh, evaporation, precipitation, all of that has to come into our models. So it becomes pretty complex to be able to do that. What we then, in the ocean, the computer we need to divide the ocean into several pieces. So several boxes, either in the vertical and in the horizontal. So remember, we are trying to trace those pieces of particles around the world. We've actually run a model uh, for 61 years around Australia. And the only reason we can do that is because of the computer facilities at Pawsey. So now we are going to looking at the circulation in the ocean, particularly around Australia. So we use a model that we named as OSROMS. Basically, the model system is called ROMS, so Os for Australia. And in this one, we are basically looking at how the currents around Australia change over time, over seasons, and the connectivity of different parts of water with other parts of Australia. So in this one, this is quite a large model. We have roughly about 25 million uh, points in this uh, model domain, and we make a calculation every second. So you can imagine that 25 million points every second for 15 years. That's a lot of calculations and a lot of memory and storage that we want. So this particular plot is showing us how the sea surface temperature is changing or varying along the domain. So it's warmer in the tropical parts and colder in the subtropical parts. So here, again, we're showing you the mean currents around Australia. Strong currents are in red, and you can see they're quite red along the coast around the whole of Australia. How does things drift in the water? So we actually talked about how parcels of water move, but we also want to know how debris or pieces of plastic, which some of them might be sticking out of the water and some of this actually. So they have both the atmosphere and the ocean, which is important. So here we need to take into account the waves, which, we to, uh, which induce what we call the Stokes drift. We need to look at the effect of the winds on the individual particles. We want to know how they mix through the water column. All of that has to be in our model. So when we build these models, we need to have all of these systems included in the model.
In this particular case, we want to know what is the atmosphere is doing. We need to have a wave model, which is actually doing uh, calculating the wave conditions. We need to have an ocean circulation model. And all of those three, the winds, the waves, and the circulation, particularly in the surface, then we put into what we call a particle model. So particle tracking, so this is the one that is actually tracking individual pieces rather than parcels of water. When we actually look at the system, the wind effects, just the surface of the water, maybe the top one meter or so, and so we need to have a good uh, representation of those effects on the surface. In a similar manner, the effect of the waves. As the waves move uh, in the same direction, some of the particles will also move. So we have to take those into account as well. In terms of the surface drift, we actually say it's roughly about 3% of the wind speed. And then the, source, the Stokes drift, the effect of the waves, is roughly the same magnitude as around 3% of the wind speed. The other part that we talk about is what we call wind age. Wind age is the effect of the wind directly on a particle or a, a, a debris, a piece of debris, let's say. So if our uh, debris, let's say, is low in the water, the effect of the wind is low because it's only affecting what is under the water surface. But if, depending on how much of that piece of debris is above the water, then you actually have much more bigger effects of the wind. The, the dip, more difficult part is what we call the leeway divergence. The leeway divergence basically says, effect of the wind, we talked before about how it affects, but the leeway says what direction it goes. And in fact, it can actually go uh, depending on the shape of the particle in either way. Now we go on to looking at the search for MH370. Mm. From what I have just talked about, you can see to looking at how possible debris which might have originated from the MH370, we can track them using our expertise that we built up in terms of how we trace different parcels of water or different pieces of debris. Some of, to, to give you a background, the Malaysian Airlines MH370 was on a journey from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing uh, on the 8th of March. And then uh, about an hour into its flight, it turned to the west and then turned back again. And it disappeared. So after looking at some of the information, they first started looking in the South China Sea uh, for any debris. And then they said, no, it's not in the South China Sea. It is in the Andaman Sea. So they moved their search to the Andaman Sea. And then they said, no, based on some the data that is from the Inmarsat satellite, which actually collected this data from the engines um, from the MH370, the search basically moved. So based on this data, the, uh, around about the 17th of March, so about 11 days after the disappearance of the flight, it moved to the Indian Ocean. So the Indian Ocean, they started looking at three main regions. They started in area one to the south, then they moved to area two, then they moved to area three, and then they moved back to area two, and then back to area one. So it was not, we are still looking for it. The Inmarsat data, which is basically a, uh, an acoustic noise from, emitted from the engines, is picked up by a geostationary satellite. So basically all it tells us is that the time difference between the uh, emitting of that sound and the satellite. So that doesn't give you a precise system, but it basically gives you a circle. So that circle is actually getting bigger and bigger as time goes on. 
And so they are called different arcs. And the seventh ping was the last one they found. So that's why they call it the seventh arc. So the seventh arc is a circle, and part of that obviously goes into Africa. But there was not enough time or dis uh, uh, fuel availability for the plane to get that far. So the seventh arc along the southeast Indian Ocean is the most likely location of the plane disappearing. But we don't know where along the seventh arc. So that is the big question. So how can we actually find out where along the seventh arc this plane may be? But the only information for almost 14 or 15 months was only the Inmarsat data. They started looking at different uh, locations. So what is showing in yellow are the areas that they have been looking at based on that seventh arc from the Inmarsat data. The ATSB, which is the Australian Federal Agency, uh, tasked with the different uh, of searching for the MH370. They did a whole lot of uh, flight simulations and different tracks, etc., and came up with a hotspot around about uh, in the 36 to 37 as being the most likely location of the plane, and that's what they actually searched for two and a half years, uh, 125,000 square kilometers, but they did not find this. Uh, any evidence of the plane. When we started using our models, we said none of these, the most likely, this debris would end up in Madagascar or in the Western Indian Ocean along the Western, uh, along the countries of Eastern Africa in, in the southern part. So South Africa, Mozambique, uh, Tanzania, but most likely Madagascar is with the most likely position. On the 30th, sorry, 29th of July, we actually have what we call a piece of the plane called the Flaperon, ended up in Reunion Island. And this is where we said most likely the debris would end up. This is the, the data that we predicted where the debris might end up in, and Reunion Island is just to the east of Madagascar, and we were the first to basically predict that it would happen. Of course, we predicted 12 or 13 months before the flaperon ended up. This is some of the, the data that we were actually looking at, uh, and this shows how the, reunion, the, the debris might end up in Reunion Island. So, of course, there was very wide interest then about how we can actually do better in terms of the model and that's how then Posey came to us and said would you like our facilities to do more computing and we said yes so now again we have to sort of think about it in terms of to give you a an idea of the computing that we want to do most of the the currents and the circulation is already being calculated so we actually have the current patterns but what we do in these systems is that we release 50,000 particles and then we track where that 50,000 particles may go. And we do that every hour. So 50,000 particles every hour for three years. So that is the type of computing power that we require to be able to do. That's only for one simulation. So if you want to do a repeat simulation, you have to do that many, many times. So that's where Porsche came in to help us. Okay, so what we started doing, we looked at 25 locations along the seventh arc, ranging from the southern end to the northern end. So we want to know the time at which this uh, debris would take to go to reunion. We release 50,000 particles at each of the 25 locations along the seventh arc. And then we simulated them from the 8th of March when the plane disappeared to the 28th of July 2015 when the flaperon was found. So we wanted to know 
what is the optimum time from our model that Flaperon would have taken to travel from the crash site to Reunion Island. If we started off in the southernmost, by the end of July, the debris would not have reached Reunion Island. When we come to location 11, the debris would just about got there. So that would be our southernmost bound. When we go to location 18, I definitely would have got there and would have actually gone past Madagascar. If you go the northernmost, it would have got there much, much quicker, three or four months earlier. So it cannot be that far north. So in between is what we actually say the plane may be. And this could be between location 11 or 18. We actually uh, was approached by Blaine Gibson, who was going trying to help people find where this debris might end up in. So he was asking me, can you tell me where to go to find additional debris? You said it will come in Reunion Island. Where else can I go? So I said, go to Madagascar. And he said, oh, I've been to Madagascar. Tell me somewhere else. And I said, well, then go to Ma Mozambique. So he went to Mozambique, and within two days, where I told him to go, he found this piece of debris. Then several other pieces of debris have been found in, in the region. In total to date, about 27 pieces have been found, but there are other uh, pieces that have not been officially uh, recorded. So after two year simulations, we could actually say where the debris might end up in, in different parts of the Western Indian Ocean. Then he came again and asked me, he said, where should I go next? I said, Madagascar, Raiki Beach. And there he went to Raiki Beach and he found more debris. And he found about five or six pieces of debris in that particular beach. This is the biggest piece. It was another uh, which was found in uh, Tanzania. Uh, but when we're looking at our models, they also predict where that area is to the north, Pemba Island. So the particles going to the north of Madagascar will end up in Tanzania. So some of the, the debris that Blaine found actually came along and he showed it to me before he uh, handed it into the ATSB and the Malaysian. So these are the different debris locations that has been found. So the white dots shows the areas that we were predicting from the model to being the most likely areas where debris will end up in. And the, the red circles, I've actually highlighted them. Most of the finds of the debris is from those locations which we have the highest density of particles from our model ending up. So there's a good correlation between the two. This movie actually shows you the debris starting around about 32.5. Those are the, the places that we seeded the particles that we found all of that debris in those Western Indian Ocean. And now it actually shows you how that debris got there in a movie.